true privileges. We get very few true privileges in life. Those tri privileges that are born out of trust and honesty and responsibility, being a parent, being at someone's side as they take that last breath of life and sharing somebody's story. Being trusted to tell a story that they believe you can tell just as well as they can, and they lived it. Growing up, I knew that there were two things I would not be. One was a teacher. And there were generations of teachers before me. My mom sits right over here. And I could not do what she did. I could not go into a classroom of six and seven year olds and think that the chaos was the most amazing sound I had ever heard. So teaching was out. The other thing I knew I wasn't going to be, and that was a farmer. My father sits right over here. And generations before him were farmers. But if I wanted a green thumb, I couldn't even take a Sharpie and draw on that thumb and make it green as much as I may have wanted to. But what I could do is I could be a storyteller. And through storytelling, I could both teach people and help them grow. And that's why I decided to become a journalist. Started when I was 19, and I always said journalist because I used to think a journalist is somebody that truly experiences what happened, not just a reporter who regurgitates facts or tells you something. And as a journalist, I got to tell amazing stories. I got to tell the story of Amy Vickroy. Amy was an SDSU student who one night as she was on her way back to Brookings from Sioux Falls, she was with her boyfriend and got hit head on by a drunk driver, a man who had more DUIs than you can count on two hands. And when doctors told Amy that we don't think you're going to be able to walk again, Amy, who was a dance major, said, well, I forgive him. We all make mistakes. I got to tell the story of a Canton mom who woke up in the middle of the night, her lungs filled with smoke, and all she could hear was that shrill sound of a fire alarm and she realized that the only way to get to her three-month-old daughter was to punch her hand through a glass window and climb in and pull that little girl out of her crib. My privilege was being able to share that little girl's story. Even though she never saw her first birthday, she touched a lot of lives, and that family trusted me with that story. I also got to sit into a lot, in a lot of courtrooms, and I will always remember the eight-year-old who stood before a judge and told him how her stepfather, who was in the same room, had taken pictures of her and posted them on the internet. And she trusted us with the privilege of telling her story, sharing her courage and her bravery. But what I never realized through all of those stories, the hundreds and thousands that I told and I shared, was that there was one story that I couldn't even see, one story that I needed to tell. And to get to that story, I want all of us to think of our own. So take a second here, grab your wallet, grab your purse, and I want you to dig out your driver's license. Chris, I won't ask you what the weight says. Don't worry. But I want you to dig that out. And I'll pull mine here too. But I will not tell you how tall I am. And I want you to take a look at that driver's license. Take a look at it and look at the picture which usually are not very flattering, I know. And instead of seeing who you are now, I want you to see who you were. I want you to see who you were as a teenager, that first moment that you got your driver's license, and that feeling of freedom, being able to do whatever you wanted, go wherever you wanted, and remember that moment. Well, somehow, the state of Nebraska decided to give this girl who was four foot nine at the time, a driver's license too. And at four foot nine, usually the Taurus that I drove looked like it was on autopilot, because you couldn't see me from the back. And I had learned that the only way to see really over the steering wheel was to sit on two books. You couldn't use a pillow, because a pillow would smush down. So you had to use two books, and I had it all figured out. It was a calculus book and a chemistry book, and I could see. And somehow, State of Nebraska said, yeah, that girl passed, we'll let her drive. But when I look at her, and when I look at my driver's license, I don't think of the freedom that most teenagers do. 
of going to parties, hanging out with friends, shopping. But for me, it was being able to, maybe even just once, maybe more than once, be able to drive myself to and from work and to and from a home where I was a babysitter. And at that house, I watched a little girl, precocious, kind of sandy blonde curls, full of life, and we became very close with their family. When you say family friend, they were more family than they were friend. So close that when she was in her last hours of life, dying from a brain tumor, we stood in her hospital room, held her hand, and hugged her. And that was a privilege. But what no one knew at the time was at the same time, I was working for her father. A Main Street business, kind of that Norman Rockwell image of what we think of as small town America, Main Street, picture perfect store. But when I walked through that Norman Rockwell door, for me it was a Stephen King horror film. Because he would take me into a back room with that kind of damp, musky smell, and he would take off my clothes, and he would touch me and molest me and rape me. A man that was a teacher, a revered business owner, a church leader, a father. Someone who would say, I love you. I love you. And one time, I remember looking down and seeing my underwear, those little girls Hanes underwear, because I was so tiny at that point that my mom had to buy my underwear in the little girls section, not where most teenagers got their clothes. And I looked at that, and I was horrified, thinking I was just a child. And he took my clothes off, and he raped me. And the next day, he said, you know what I did to you yesterday? I have it all on video. And in those moments, I died. Who I was ceased to exist. And I didn't tell anyone. It wasn't that he explicitly put words of fear at me or toward me or in me, but it was that he implicitly made me fearful of all the things I could lose. My full ride scholarships, my 4.0 GPA, the pride of my family, the honor in my community. And I thought I could lose all of those and I couldn't tell anyone. And if you're uncomfortable right now, I understand. It's not a topic we talk about. It's not a topic that people publicly come out and say, I'm a survivor. But it's one that we should talk about because it happens more than we realize. One in four girls by the time they're 18 and one in seven boys, it's estimated, will be sexually abused. Of those, 90% knew their abuser. 88% of cases it's expected do not go reported, such as mine. I didn't report it. I didn't even let myself believe it had happened. I pushed it so far back and so far away and locked it in the deepest, darkest parts of my mind that it didn't exist. Until a February day two years ago. Cold, brutally cold. You know those bitter days when you go from your car to the house and it's only like seven or eight feet, but you get inside and it's more than being chilled to the bone, you're frozen in your soul. And on that day I, I got inside and I was so cold and the only way to warm up, to get my hands to move, were to put them under hot running water. And I did that and they got feeling in them. And I looked over at the clock on the stove and it said 532. And I opened a bottle of pills, and I took every single one. Because I knew there was no other way I thought I could go on living. Because it wasn't that I wanted to die, I didn't know how to live. And I wrapped myself in a kind of dingy, gray, white comforter, and I closed my eyes and thought, I won't wake up tomorrow but at least I won't be cold, and at least this darkness will stop following me. 
And the tremendous thing was, the next morning, even on a February day, these beams of light came through our wooden blinds. And I felt this warmth. And I realized I was still here. I was here. And I was here because I had a story left to tell. And I had to tell that story. And that was why what I had thought would take away the cold was really my way of finding the warmth. And in those moments, I knew the closure wouldn't exist for me, but that I would pray for justice, I would find peace, and in that peace, I would find a purpose. And for me, that purpose is what I call self-spiration. It is my goal of building a camp for child sexual assault survivors, where they can go and they can share their stories, they can be with others, and know that they are not alone. And it's also a place for adult survivors to come and put purpose to what happened to them. Because we are survivors. It's no different than, than someone who's diagnosed with cancer. We did nothing to deserve this, but we fought through it. self spiration is also a place to celebrate birthdays. Not the kind of birthday that we usually think of with cakes and candles and, and Chuck E. Cheese or presents, but the birthday of empowerment, the birthday when we take our power back. And for me, my second birthday was on January 15th, 2011. I just want to record this so that I can look back and I can see how far I came and I can remind myself that I have nothing to be scared of and that he holds no power over me and that I am a strong, empowered person and that he needs to be held accountable for what he did and there's nothing that can happen to me. 45 seconds later, I was at his front door. My husband, Nate, at my side. And I believe my grandparents watching over me. And I rang that doorbell, and he came out. And I knew that whatever he said didn't really matter. He could have said anything. What mattered was that I left knowing I had said what I needed to say. And I looked at him straight in the eyes, and I said, I know what you did to me, and I will not be quiet. nightmare that I've lived with for so long. And I can't. you wake up and the lights turn on. And you realize that you had control of it. Like, you know, like I was in control then. But I'm in control now. This is my story. This isn't the end of my story. This is the beginning of my story. And now it is my utmost honor and privilege to ask you to share that story as well. Thank you.